So I'm going to try to do a number of concepts quickly as, as I can, but just to kind of uh, introduce a few things around how life science thinks about knowledge graphs and how life science thinks about fair data and fair data knowledge graphs. Okay, so, so I lead a program at AstraZeneca called Integrative Informatics, and it's basically a systems biology play. And so what we're basically trying to do is take all of the data that we generate, mostly in translational science, so some from patients, some from animal studies, bring it all together and ask questions of it. As you can see from the diagram, it's layered, so you can have it at the organ level, the tissue level, the cellular level, and the molecular level. And so you need to think about how these layers come together. But it's basically to understand biology, to understand how our drugs work, to understand how patients and patient populations respond, uh, and to really um, set this up as the foundation for moving information and medicine through the pipeline. And so it, this is a really challenging problem to do right now because of the state of our data and the state of the companies in general and how, how data comes into companies. Um, we have it fragmented in multiple different repositories and electronic laboratory notebooks. Uh, we don't frequently think about reuse as it comes together. Um, assembling this data for systems biology questions is challenging, and then being able to set that up for the right analytics is challenging as well. And then just sort of the nature of the biopharma industry in general and how we acquire assets, how we acquire companies, how we're spread geographically. All of these things make these challenges of bringing together all of this data to, to build new medicines really, really hard. And so what have we done to address this? So, so our approach was to build a fair data knowledge graph. And so you might be able to make this out if you're close enough, right in the middle is a patient is represented within this knowledge graph. And then hanging off the patient nodes are things like measurements. So those are the green boxes. And then off of uh, those are some of the values themselves. And then heading toward the pink boxes is the taxonomy that's used to describe the measurement hierarchy. So what is FAIR data? Has anybody heard of this acronym before? Has this come across? Oh, great. So we've got a few people. So FAIR is short for findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. It came out of the IMI OpenFAX project, um, which was itself about four or five years ago. Uh, Dean Alamang and others uh, in the room helped with the genesis of this, of this project. It was really an effort to take all of this public reference database that we have in chemistry and biology and, and, and biological sequences and bring them together so that we didn't have to keep doing this job over and over and over within pharma. We wanted one repository that would be able to bring this together. Um, that project's still around, but what it really did was give birth to this idea of can we actually do semantics at scale? Can we do graph at scale? Is this thing actually going to work? And so this got uh, about eight or nine of the pharma partners that were involved in a number of the uh, European uh, academic institutions and government to buy into this idea. And so they got together at uh, University of Leiden toward the end of the project and also brought in a number of participants that weren't there at the original event. Um, so one of the things that FAIR is trying to accomplish is better data stewardship. So you have all these big government-sponsored uh, granting agencies that in systems biology generate you know, thousands of terabytes of data. You want to be able to describe that in such a way that it can be used for other purposes beyond the original way that it was connected. And you want to be able to have it not necessarily just sit at a, at a website, which is going to die as link rot makes it impossible to find it. And so this was the whole idea, better data stewardship, and this is where, where FAIR came about. And so I'm just going to go through the principles real briefly, and, and not at any high level. And I will post these slides on SlideShare, too, so don't worry if you miss something. Just go look up tplasterer at SlideShare, and you'll get them. Um, so findable. Findable is really about the identifiers that are used to pull this data together. Typically, it's a URI. It's a global persistent identifier, really similar in concept to this PERM ID. So maybe the only distinction here is it's using like HTTP, HTTPS. When you go to that, you get something useful, whether it's data or metadata. It will resolve and tell you what, what it is. Um, then accessible is not just common access protocols, uh, typically HTTP, HTTPS, and security, authentication, authorization. This becomes really, really important, and maybe you know, obvious if you start thinking about who some of the other participants at the original event were. This is where we got the publishers involved. So this is where Nature Genetics played a really prominent role. This is where Elsevier played a really prominent role. They love the idea of you know, open data, and, but they're really concerned about what does this then mean for our business model? What does this then mean for you know, the narrative going into a digital representation? Can we come up with a way that we can still do that and still change our business model from print to software to services to knowledge graph, and Accessible lets you do that. 
So now you've got the publishers on board, so that was a really, really important piece. Uh, interoperable is about the shared vocabularies and taxonomies that we use, so being able to bring these together under a, a common way of describing this. And then reusable is the other three, plus provenance, plus attribution, and licensing. So that, that's what FAIR is in a nutshell, and that's really what we wanted to accomplish within our Knowledge Graph project so that we could make this seamlessly work within the company, within the company silos, but then also across the company as we start thinking about partnerships. All right, so this is one of the things that I really wanted to get out of this conference was some sort of a, a clear definition of what a Knowledge Graph is. I think we throw some of these terms out. So uh, I, I feel like we're on our way. And so I just want to give you three that I'm pulling from for, for loose of how we use it. So there's sort of the classic ontology. If you go to Wikipedia, they say a knowledge graph is an ontology. I don't think we feel that that's all like, quite how we think about it. Maybe you can think about it as an ontology that's also populated uh, with some instance data. So I think you're getting closer there. Um, there's other uh, de definitions from sort of the Google Knowledge Graph project that uh, leans heavily on that idea, especially if you consider Google Knowledge Graph was incubated via MetaWeb, and then it also comes to the other side coming over from schema.org. So a lot of similar history. And I think we also have a, a number of players that have been in here for a long time, like Top Quadrant, that really look at this as a flexible, evolvable, semantic intelligence system. Again, here it's based on RDF. It doesn't have to be. Um, a lot of, I should have said first, the, the fair data principles are principles. They don't say that you have to use a particular standard, although most of the implementations that we've seen are in RDF. So we're down here. Maybe see it on the with the Gartner hype curve. Uh, down in the middle are the beginning, heading up the hype curve. And so one of the things that I want to talk a little bit about uh, was some of the key features and differentiators as we start thinking about knowledge graphs. So for us, what we're building is really a federated knowledge graph. And partially, this is due to the nature of the data and how much control we have over it. But partially, it's just due to the idea that we don't want to throw everything in a data lake and figure it out later. So that's part of the things you have to figure out first. Is, is federation important to you? Is this really an integration play, or are you really thinking about the knowledge graph doing some sort of graph analytic method? And you can, you can do both. Um, but if you don't do the integration, you can't do the, the latter deeper analytics. Um, thinking about standard support. Are you looking at something that builds on standards like Sparkle, or do you have to do a new query language to make it work? Um, does your knowledge graph support analytics? And does it enable things like reasoning? Uh, or is that something you want to plug in later? And is your knowledge graph a hybrid? I mean, are you really talking about something that has to be a graph at all times? Or are you talking about something that yeah, maybe I'll leave the data in place um, and then reach over the top of it with the metadata layer that speaks graph that will then bring it together? And we've, we've definitely chosen the latter there. And then one of the other pieces that's really important is thinking, how fair do I really want this knowledge graph to be? Um, FAIR is really about teaching machines how to think about graph. And so, so when you're building these, these, these features and you're thinking about reasoners and you're thinking about rules agents and all these sort of things, remember that at the end of the day, you're trying to build a graph that's going to teach a machine how to do tedious tasks so you don't have to do it. And so teaching machines is really hard. And so that's something that you really have to put a lot of effort into getting your semantics right so that's even possible. And this is one of the reasons why you want to do things like make it FAIR, because then at least you're on your way. So we started with a really simple approach that wasn't more complicated than this. We're big believers in concept maps. And so it's, it's how, do you, how do you take the business representation out of a scientist's head from that virtual whiteboard and pull it together? And, and I apologize, you're not going to be able to see this all that well. But this was really thinking about how do we think about studies relating to the subjects within those studies. Uh, relating to uh, whether or not there was a visit associated with those. We, we may or may not have had a biological sample that was taken at those uh, visits uh, that could have had a measurement with multiple different measuring technologies. And so one of the things that you get out of this knowledge graph type approach is that you have things, like for those of you that can see measurement, there are three ways that you can get into measurement. You can get into measurement from a subject, from a visit, or from a sample. And so if you're thinking about RDF speak, this is three domains for the, the class measurement. This is not something that you can do very easily with the relational space at all. And this was something that took a while for the, our collaborators to wrap their minds around that you could do something like this. Um, the other thing that you can do with these sort of approaches is, and you can't see it because it's you know, also not shown here, but you can think about a Z-plane 
that way you could then embed a taxonomy. So if I think about this one node called uh, core technology, there's a whole lot of subclasses of technology. So that subclass of technology could be proteomics capabilities, metabolomics capabilities, genomics capabilities, transcriptomics capabilities. Within that, we have different platforms, such as affymetrics that measure your gene trip ex expression. So I now have a way of embedding a very small, or a way of creating a very small focused business-specific knowledge graph that's embedded a whole lot of other hierarchies that gives me all of the depth and complexity that I need. And so this allows us to do things like, you know, find me all uh, patients or subjects uh, diagnosed with lupus and a disease activity score above five. It's just a path to the graph. And I can similarly do, uh, you know, find all studies evaluating a particular target that have a particular type of data set associated with this. Again, it's just a path to the graph. And you can think about those as being mini applications that you can do over and over. And if you configure your user interface, then the application building process becomes a lot simpler too. So then there's really a key concept that you then have to think about, how do I really make this extend into uh, other fair content sources? And this is really around enrichment, and there's two main ways that you can do it. So um, one is sort of a direct API to API mapping. So this is uh, something that we do within our systems. And so for something like this, we might have one system that's the authoritative system for our clinical trial identifiers. But then we also want to match it up against clinicaltrials.gov. We want to match it up against the European Clinical Trial Database. We want to match it up to the WHO database. And so we will take basically APIs, map them against our internal API, and then take the results of those URIs, bring them back, and then throw them against an external one so we have this very sticky concept of a clinical study that basically captures all of the URIs that are used to describe it. Similarly, if we want to then not just see um, what this looks like for something that we already have an identifier, if we really are talking about unstructured content, we might come up with something that has a label like rheumatoid arthritis from one of our data sources. We will run that through some of our taxonomy servers and that use uh, NLP methods to be able to uh, extract the label, find the most common disease identifiers or sets of disease identifiers and then pull those back so again we have the uh, instance of rheumatoid arthritis that's as sticky as possible so that you can map that to as many possible disease databases here, in this case, human disease ontology and MeSH. And Wikidata is one of them that we can do too if we want to. Um, and then finally, there's a third class of this which is much harder, and this is where you have uh, internal, in this case, an internal technology uh, database that then needs to be mapped to both an external one which is immature and may not exist so you already are starting off with a big cross mapping problem here and so we're already sort of taking our labels we're doing the disambiguation off our labels we're going against the NCI thesaurus we're going against the experimental factor ontology we're going against the bioassay ontology so you have a whole lot that need to become coming together to be able to do this and this is also where we take hard problems like this and bring them to places like the Pistoia Alliance so that we can work in a collaborative way to say we, what we really need is a better technology vocabulary for the industry. And so then those sort of things get, get built collaboratively. All right, so if we take this small little knowledge graph that we're building so far, we can see that there's a bunch of places where if I'm thinking about how do I want to use this in another context, how do I want to make this fair, where enrichment is really critical. And so there's this concept of external, all right, so I don't need my own target vocabulary. I don't need my own disease vocabulary. I don't need my own sample vocabulary. Those should all be common and used in the public domain. So I'm not going to build those. Maybe I'll augment them just a little bit. There's going to be places where it's mostly internal. So my clinical trial ID, my project codes, therapeutic area, which is basically a different business division within the company. And there's places where it's a mix. So uh, technology, for example, is one that I just talked about. Drug is another one because we have a whole lot of things in the pipeline that aren't quite in public space yet, so we've got to have both our internal drug vocabularies and the external come together. So, so what happens when we do this is, um, you know, we start this off, we take a number of different preclinical assets, preclinical data sets, and show this pattern over and over for some of these key business questions. And then you get to the point where you have 20 of these, 100 of these, and then you start running straight into, oh, how am I going to find it? And as I start bringing this, then you run straight into the findability problem. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, um, but just to kind of give you a sense of how the data sets that represent that might have to be found, you're going through all of these different competency questions, 
around cohorts and agents and date ranges and different technologies just to find that data set so you can pull back that knowledge graph for the question that you want. And so, so the next thing we had to do was build this concept of data catalogs with data set records. Um, and so really what you're trying to do with this is just how do I come up with this card catalog representation? So think about the old days of, of going to the library. Going to the card catalog, what do you put on your card catalog so you can go find your book on the shelf? That's basically what we're trying to accomplish with these data catalogs. And I just want to jump ahead just a little bit here. And just to let you know that we had to do very, very little to actually make this work. So we took the recommendations from the W3C Healthcare Life Science Interest Group, uh, which basically said you can build the vast majority of this out of the DCAT standard. And we just had to add a couple of triples so that we could also embed things like uh, the VOID standard, which is an RDF data set standard, so we could bring these whole things together. Now, that's what you see running around the um, top left to the bottom right. So that's sort of the catalog to the data set at the summary level, to the data set at the version level, which is optional to the data set at the distribution level, which you absolutely need, because that's going to point to your files if you haven't triplified the whole thing. The whole thing gets held together with this idea of them being related to a SCOS concept, and that's the, the yellow box in the middle. You can think of this as a tag, but because that tag is also a URI, you can dual type it. So from a SCOS perspective, it's just a concept. From the knowledge graphs perspective, that thing might be a drug, it might be an indication, uh, it might be a subject. And so that's what allows you to make that leap, that seamless leap, between your data catalog and uh, your data catalog record and your knowledge graph itself. And so we do this process of multi-phase filtering to be able to do this. We go from the catalog descriptions, and this might be show me all the data sets that have a particular drug uh, being shown within that data set. And again, apologies for the glacial builds on these. And then you see, you know, you might have that metadata filter, and then you might want to filter off for particular patient records, you know, trials with more than 50 patients, for example, and then take this, run it into whatever uh, statistical analysis package you want. So now you're embedding analytics, or putting analytics right next to uh, your knowledge graph, running it off into Python and R and so forth. Take the results of that, and then push them back into the knowledge graph so the next person gets to use them as well. And so one of the platforms we use for this is the Ontoforce Discover platform to so get a sense of how you can make this query between lupus uh, into the disease area, into genes that are known to be important in lupus, into measurements that we have, into samples that have those measurements and those subjects, and then potentially trials in those data sets. So it's just sort of a way of going very far out. I want to know anything about lupus to be very internal. What are the data sets that we have that are concerned with that? And this is a little bit about how that gets recorded in the search strategy and kind of how that gets played out in some of the lenses that allow you to filter this further within this platform. OK, so, so I, I threw an, an awful lot at you at once. And uh, apologies for that. But just kind of to give you a sense of how this whole thing comes together, um, this idea of the multi-phase filtering, this idea of being able to go from the catalog record to the knowledge graph itself becomes really important when you want to partition this and do something with the data sets in a useful way. We do this all the time if we're looking at things like um, I've got a very large clinical study. Only a small portion of uh, patients within that clinical study responded. I need to build virtual cohorts so I can better understand their response. So I'm creating a new data set out of the existing data set. So this, this ability to do uh, both the model and the domain model on top of the data catalog is really important. Um, Second takeaway is that the public ontologies work for almost everything that we needed to do for DCAT, and then the business ontologies that we built to describe that expressivity between patients and so forth um, is the next piece. Again, the public ontologies are almost sufficient, and there's an awful lot of activity in this space. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, so I will post these on SlideShare. Hopefully, you guys will be able to look if there's anything you want to learn more. FAIR is mostly started from sort of the academic systems biology space, and now it's gone over into pharma. It's now starting to make it in other domains, so I think you're going to see it more and more. So again, thank you for your attention.